Welcome, and I am excited about teaching this class today because this is a combo problem. Those are always big favorites of mine if I can do sort of a combination of two things. This problem here is going to not only touch on the idea of frames and machines, but it will also bring in uh, a little bit of the concept of trusses as well. And so those of you who are in here, you have a test coming up where those are the two big topics that are going to be covered. And so that's why this is what I chose to do for this uh, problem here. So here it is. You see the, the shape of the machine sitting there and it says it's a severely overcomplicated machine and it's devised to clamp a piece of material using an input force of F as shown. Determine the mechanical advantage of this machine. So why don't we start with what it's actually asking us to do here? What is the meaning of mechanical advantage? Okay. So I think someone just said, um, this is the output force. divided by the input force, okay? And since machines are often, uh, if not always, uh, designed to sort of magnify the uh, amount of input force for the amount of output force, this is often something that makes sense for us to find. Mechanical advantage being the output force over the input force. So the output force that we are trying to determine is what? What, is, what would we identify as being the output force? Yeah. Okay, the force applied to the little clamped piece, right? And the input force, it even says in the problem, is F, okay? So for us, if we can figure out how much force is applied to the clamped piece and divide it by how much force is applied here, then that gives us a mechanical advantage, okay? So what do you think a good place might be to start this problem? Okay, free body diagram is always a good answer, right? And that's gonna be something we do very, very soon here. But let's actually think of like, you know, most of the time whenever you've solved these frames and machines problems, you have actually had a force to work with. And this time I just gave you F, okay? Let me give you a little hint. Most of these problems, matter of fact, almost all of them that you're gonna see, typically they are linear, which means that if you multiply the input force by a certain amount, that's gonna be the same amount that the output force will be multiplied by. So whenever you have a linear system like that, what you can do if you're asked a question like this is you can just assume a force, right? You can assume a force and then when you get to the end, you can divide by that force, divide that output force that you're gonna find you know, by the input force that it took for you to get there. Does that make sense? So what do you wanna set this as? I have an idea. Why don't we set this as 100 pounds, or 100 newtons, I should say. This is a, an SI units problem. So let's set it at 100 newtons, okay? And then we'll, we'll calculate what the, uh, the output force, the clamped, clamping force that is that happens on this clamped piece, okay? So we'll start there. Then what should we do? Someone said a free body diagram. And so that's not a bad idea, but let's talk about our free body diagrams a little bit before we actually draw one. One of the things that you know is that in these frames and machines problems, you typically draw free body diagrams of what kinds of bodies? Okay, they are stationary, that's not a bad answer, but there's, there's something more specific, okay? You're looking for bodies that are non-concurrent force systems. Right? You don't necessarily want to draw free body diagrams of joints or free body diagrams of two force members. You're looking for bodies that sort of have multiple forces where the lines of action of all the forces don't all intersect at the same point. Right? So now let's, let's try to look at this body and identify some of those non-concurrent force systems. Okay? Where do you see non-concurrent force systems here? Okay, but certainly member ABI, right? It's going to have multiple lines of action that don't all intersect at a common point. So yes, certainly ABI is going to be one of the free body diagrams that we might want to draw. 
Okay, any other ones? Okay, the, ne the next kind of uh, relatively obvious one is uh, H-E-D or D-E-H. Okay, that one is also something where there's going to be multiple lines of action, not all intersecting at a common point. Okay, so after this, it gets just a little bit more murky. And here's why. One of the bodies, I'm going to put quotes around that, one of the bodies that we can deal with here is actually a composition of several bodies. Okay, And so this is a principle that you may not have actually uh, been presented yet, but if you can identify some subset of stuff that composes this system, subset of bodies that composes the system, and that set of bodies is what I call self-rigid, meaning if you removed it from its supports, it would hold a constant shape, okay? Then you can treat that body, if it's self-rigid, then you can treat that composition of several bodies as being a body itself, kind of you can treat it all as one thing. So having heard that, what do you think I'm referring to or I'm trying to get at with respect to this problem? Okay. B, C, E, G, that is actually a little truss inside of this frame, okay, or machine, I really maybe should say, okay? That is a little truss inside of there. You can tell because it's all composed of two force members, and those two force members are all arranged in triangles, right? There's nothing that composes something other than a triangle in that little set. So that means that that little free body diagram, BCEG, that, that's something that we can separate from the rest of it, but we don't have to separate it from itself, right? We can leave it composed as that little set of bodies and treat it like it is a rigid body itself, because it is, okay? So what I would then propose is that we probably have three bodies that we need to draw free body diagrams of. We identified them as ABI, we identified one of them as HED, and then another one as BCEG. So let's draw those three free body diagrams and kind of see where that takes us, okay? Which one do you want to start with? Someone pipe up. Which one should we start with? Okay, you want to start with the one that's kind of strange, right? It's the truss that's in the middle of this thing. So let's start with BCEG. And just to emphasize here that um, we are treating all of that as a rigid body, I'm going to just draw it like one thing here. Okay, I'm not, I'm not even going to show the member that's on the inside. As a matter of fact, if I really wanted to emphasize this, I could do something like this too, and I could sort of shade the whole thing, right? Say this is one rigid body that we're going to treat this way, right? So let's say that's B, C, E, G, and we need to look at all the forces that are applied to that body. So give me one. What's applied to that body? F. Okay, that's an easy one, right? We've got this force that's acting up here of 100 pounds. Or, excuse me, newtons. I did it again. 100 newtons. Okay. So that's one of the forces that acts on here. Anything else? Okay. So someone says BC, okay? Now, here's, here's something that I want to say about that. So BC is a member. What kind of member is it? It's a two-force member, okay? It is also a piece of the uh, kind of that truss that we just separated that we said we aren't going to actually take that truss apart. We're going to leave it together. So I'm going to say let's not draw uh, a force that's like BC, okay? What you got? Okay, the slot, I agree, the slot is a good place to look right here. And the slot applies a force kind of this direction, right? How do I know that there's going to be some kind of a direction or, or that I know the direction of the force that's applied from the slot to the truss? Yeah, anytime you have a slot like this, assuming it's frictionless, which again, I've, I've told you before, if I don't say anything about it, you can assume frictionless, okay? So we'll assume it's frictionless. And we know that the line of action of force that acts in that slot right there has to be perpendicular to the slot, okay? So we'll say it's perpendicular to the slot. What can I do to further emphasize that it is perpendicular? Or kind of really give the specifics of what that means because it's perpendicular, okay? 
we know the slope because we know the slope of the geometry of this member uh, HED, right? Really from H to E, we know the slope of that. What's the slope? A rise of 20 centimeters for that member right there for a run of, okay? Up here, we've got 15 and 15, so that'd be a run of 30. Now, here's the thing, though. That's the line that extends from H to E. But we need a line that's perpendicular to that one, right? So what do we do to make a perpendicular slope to the slope of that member HE? You just reverse rise and run, right? So here we had a run of 30 and a rise of 20. So that means right here, OK, we're going to have a run of 20 and a rise of 30. See how I just reversed those, which one was the rise and which one was the run? OK. Furthermore, I need to name this force. What do you want to name it? RE. I tell you what, I actually like FE better. OK. And, you know, I, I, I hope you'll forgive me for uh, kind of changing that. So I typically use R's when I'm dealing with sort of the external reactions to the whole system, right? That's my method. You know, you don't have to do that, but that's what I usually do. Okay, so there's little FE that I've got right there. What else acts on this body? What you got? Okay, GH. Okay, I'm looking here real quick. GH. So how does GH act on G? Okay, someone says it pulls down. I agree with that. How do we know that? It's a rope. And so ropes can only carry tension. And tension means that it's trying to draw the body it's connected to toward where the other point of connection is of the rope. So that means that this must be trying to draw G down toward H. And that's what I'd represented there with that arrow. Okay, so this is what I'd call T rope. Okay, good so far. What else? Okay, so the clamped piece is actually experiencing a force. That's going to transmit through the roller that's connected to the pin at G, right? And because it's a roller, that means that we can only have a, a reaction force perpendicular to the surface it's rolling against, right? So it looks pretty close to me like that surface is vertical right there. So it means that we must have a horizontal reaction that happens at G from the clamping force. And if you'll uh, permit me, I'll call this just F clamp. OK, how did I know to draw it to the right? OK, yeah, so if the clamped piece is being compressed, then that means the clamped piece, If the, let's think about that clamped piece, the clamped piece is experiencing this, right? Do you agree with that? So by Newton's third law, this force right here is the one that I'm kind of looking at the other side of it here at, the, uh, at, at point G, right? So it means that I must have equal magnitude opposite direction, okay? Because that's the clamping force that's happening on that member. Okay, so he says, well, how, how would the roller actually behave? So, so think about the roller here. Here's what the roller experiences. So the roller is experiencing that magnitude of force because this was going to the left, that one's going to go to the right. It means that the force in this pin must go back to the left again, which means that the force that the roller puts on the pin at G must go back to the right again. Does that make sense? So there is a chain of uh, kind of how that force transmits through those multiple pieces. I skipped basically a couple of steps there to show F clamp, but that is the correct direction of showing that, that compressive force in that clamped piece. It will act to the right on that bigger body BCEG. Okay, so that's another good one. Um, we're still missing at least one or maybe more. What else? Okay. B. Now, here's the thing. At B, are there any kind of principles we can bring to bear on this that will let us do something more shrewd, like just put one component of force? Or do we have to look at it and say, for general pins, they can apply two components of force? Do we have anything special we can do at point B 
to kind of eliminate one of our unknowns that we otherwise would have to have just for a general pin. I see some, some heads going, nope, there's nothing we can do right there. I agree with you. There's nothing we can do right there. We don't know the direction or the magnitude of the force between uh, the truss and member ABI. Okay, so that means I've got to put two components of reaction. And I'll, since I don't have a, I don't even have a feel for what direction they should go, um, I'll just choose kind of positive here. And I'm going to call this one BY. I'm going to call this one BX. Okay. So that's a reasonably good free body diagram, or at least a start on one. What else should I put on here to make it more complete? Okay, some lengths, right? So let me do this. There is, um, you know, a, a distance of 30 centimeters across from here to here. There's another distance of 15 centimeters. Right here. Okay. What other distances might matter to us here? Okay, would you say maybe that it's also 30 centimeters down here? And then one more that I have in mind. A height, right, exactly. So, you know, the 25 centimeters of height, that might also matter. All right, so there's one free body diagram that might matter to us. Now let's kind of look through it before we start trying to do any kind of math. Can there be, or is there anything we can solve for off of that diagram? Okay, the shrewd things you can do, right? You can, you can try to find locations where there's a large number of unknown forces all intersecting at a common point. And if you can do that, um, and then end up with only one thing that you don't know, then what can you do? You can solve for that one thing. So do we have anything like that on this diagram? No, this one's tricky because we don't know two things at point G, right? We also don't know two things at point B. We also have another unknown at point E that goes in this, we do know the direction, but we don't know the magnitude at point E, okay? So given the, all the things that we don't know, I think the best thing to do is draw another free body diagram of one of our other pieces, okay? Maybe something interesting will pop out when we do that. So which other piece should we go to next? Okay, someone says they wanna do uh, DEH. So let me do that one right here, okay? Something like this. There's a little pin right here, and I'm going to try to make it kind of realistic here, real to what it looks like on the page. Okay, there's a little slot right here. All right, so there's that body, and then we have another point that's down here. It says that's a small pulley down there at H. All right. So there's the body. We just isolated um, DEH. Now what? Okay, which forces do you want to draw on there? Someone says draw the forces. Okay, D needs some reaction forces. So again, I don't necessarily know what direction those are going to go. So I'm just going to show them sort of in the positive X and Y, assuming that rightward is positive and upward is positive. Okay, so let's say that this is DX. This is dy, okay? Which, this probably also needs another little bit of discussion. Why did I not choose to just put one force? Why did I put two? It's a pin, and nothing connecting to that pin is a two-force member. I can't identify a two-force member right there, so I'm not free to just show one component of force. I've got to show two components of force because it's, you know, member uh, DEH is not a two-force member. Okay, good job so far. What's next? Okay, so force FE. Now this is an interesting one because up till now, we have not done any that have appeared on a previous free body diagram, right? At least in this problem, we haven't gone to a point where we've tried to show something that was already on a different free body diagram. What about this one? Okay, 
This one, I already showed this force over on this right free body diagram. So I need to be consistent with how I showed it on that diagram when I show it on this diagram. How do I do that consistently? Okay, equal magnitude, opposite direction. So same line of action, but this time I'm showing it in the opposite direction. Okay, and I can indicate that that line of action is still the same by giving it the same slope, right? Rise of 30 for a run of 20. Okay, that's good. And uh, just to kind of emphasize this, we assumed back here when we did the other one that it was perpendicular to that slot, and so it's still perpendicular to that slot, right? That's, but uh, that arose because we knew the slope of that member between E and H, okay? What else? The rope, okay? And what you can do with the rope is assuming you've got a frictionless pulley. And again, if it doesn't say anything about the pulley, you can assume that it's frictionless, right? At least for these problems. So we already had T rope acting down on this other piece at G. To be consistent with what the rope is doing, that means it's also trying to draw H towards G. Because if it's trying to draw G toward H, it's trying to draw H toward G. Right? So to be consistent with this, I have to show it the opposite direction of what I showed the other one over here. OK? Good so far there. Um, is that the only rope force that I need to consider at point H? OK? What's the other one? OK? There's another piece that kind of sticks over here pointing toward point I. That also has a magnitude of T rope. OK? And the principle there is that when you have a rope going around a frictionless pulley, um, the, the tension in the rope is going to be the same on both sides of the rope, like both on one side of the pulley as well as on the other side of the pulley. All right. Good there. Is there anything else I can say about that component of T-rope? OK. Yeah, it, we know the slope of it because we know the geometry of how H extends towards I, right? That line from H to I. We actually know what that is, and so I'm going to put the slope of that line on that force. It has a rise of 20 and a, and a run of 30. Okay? Any other forces acting on this body? Okay? There aren't, but we're still not quite done. What else do we need to do? OK, we need some lengths. So let's put one of them up here. OK, what's the width across from uh, point D horizontally over toward point H? 30 centimeters. OK, what other lengths do we need? OK, so I'm going to give myself just a little more room here. OK, we need to know the heights, right? So we know how high it is here, right? What's that height? OK, that's 25 centimeters. And what's another height that we might need? OK. Get this out of the way just a little bit here. Um, how high it is from E to H. OK, and that was 20 centimeters. OK, good deal. What else do we have? OK, well, I tell you what. Yeah, someone says, well, we could do a free body diagram of ABI. Let's do a little uh, inventory real quick. Did drawing this free body diagram give us anything that you know, allows us to move forward? OK. So if we, if we do moments around D, someone suggests moments around D, how many unknowns do I have on that diagram? Two. 
And if we go and combine that with, uh, let's say, the other diagram and do moments around, let's say, B for the other diagram that we've already drawn, okay? Can we solve everything then? Why not? Yeah, so we have two equations, or two uh, variables, excuse me, that, that exist on both of these. We have a third one on this one that doesn't exist over here. We've got three things that we don't know, right? So just with two equations, two moment equations, doesn't, doesn't do it for us yet, okay? So why don't we move on? Someone suggested doing this other free body diagram. Sounds good to me. Let's do this other free body diagram. Okay, so it'll look something like this. I don't know if I'm gonna win an art contest with that one, but we'll, uh, we'll call it good. Let's say this is point A, this is point B, right? Um, and then we have a point I that's directly below uh, point A, okay? <clears throat> so let me label those real quick. This is A, this is I, this is B. All right, what forces act on this body? Okay, the reaction at A, someone says. So what is the nature of the reaction at A? The question you always ask yourself is, is this a two-force member? Okay, since it's not a two-force member, that, and you would be able to identify that, right, if it had just two locations where it connected with frictionless pins with no other forces acting anywhere else. This is certainly not that, right? So we, um, we would say it has to have two components of reaction. And I'm going to call this one RA, uh, let's see, RAX, RAY, excuse me. I just realized that I didn't follow my convention over here at D. That's why I got distracted there just a little bit. Okay, so let's call this R-A-X, okay? And I tell you what, just to make this consistent, let me do R-D-Y and R-D-X. This doesn't really matter, like, you know, uh, you can use your own naming convention, but I kind of do this so that I remember what the nature of each of these forces is like, okay? All right. Cool, what else acts on body A-B-I? Okay, someone says that uh, at B, right, we already had defined the two forces that act on the truss part of this at B. So to do a consistent, you know, transfer to this diagram, we better do equal magnitude opposite direction. I agree with that. So we're going to show a force down like this, BY, and a force, this one was to the right, so this one should be to the left, right? So this should be BX. Now what? Okay. There's tension at I, right? And what's the name of that force? T rope. Okay. And again, um, if the effect of the rope is to try to draw H, which is down here, toward I, the effect is also to try to draw I toward H. Right? That's the same effect happening from that rope. All right. What else do I know about that force? The slope. Right? So I knew this was a rise of 20 and a run of 30. So I do the same thing here. Rise of 20 and a run of 30. Okay. Now what? Okay. I do know this force of F clamp right here. Okay. Now, I drew it on that direction. Why? Okay. Remember, this was how the, um, that clamped material is working. So if there's a force acting to the right on the left side of that clamped material, right, it means that there must be a force acting to the left on the face that's doing the clamping. Okay. Good deal. Now what? Some distances, all right? So let's do one right here, all right? What's this distance? Okay, 25 centimeters. 
What other distances do we need? Okay, I probably want to know what this distance is right here between A and B, right? So what is that distance? 15 centimeters. Okay. And let me just emphasize here that I is along the same line as F clamp, right? So I kind of get both of those distances with that one uh, indicator there. All right. Now let's take stock again, right? Let's kind of count up some things. How many unknowns do we have? Okay. Someone says nine. So let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six on the first free, on the leftmost free body diagram. Okay. Now how many new ones on the next diagram? Okay. T rope is not new, but F E is new relative to that first diagram. And then R D X and R D Y are new. Okay. So we had six over here, right? Seven, eight, nine. Now, anything new over here? Okay, nothing we haven't named already. So yeah, we got nine unknowns. And how many bodies? Okay, three bodies. What kind of force systems are each of those? They're non-concurrent force systems. How many equations can you write for each non-concurrent force system? Three. So we have three equations for this one, three equations for this one, and three equations for that one. That means we can do a system of nine equations, right? And we've got nine unknowns. We are happy people, right? Because this means that this can be solved. It actually doesn't always mean that, but it usually means that if, you, if someone gave you the problem, they probably figured it out and it can be solved, okay? So, but we are interested in maybe making it a little bit easier than a nine by nine. Would you like to do that? Okay, I would too. I would very much like to make this easier than doing a nine by nine. One of the ways that we can do that is we can first think, what things do I not care about? Like, are there any of these components that's like, yeah, they'll end up being found along the way, but I don't necessarily care what they are, at least for the question I'm trying to answer. Okay, so D, the reactions at point D, I may not care about those right? The reactions at point A, I might not care about those. What about the reactions at B? Do I care about those? Okay. And I chose those three. Sometimes it takes you a little bit more time to think of that, but I want us to kind of make sure that we keep our solution moving here. Um, I'm going to choose those three locations as places to some moments. Okay. And we're going to see what we can make happen by choosing those locations where we have a large number of unknown forces that pass through those points, and we don't care what they turn out to be, right? So we can eliminate them from our, our equations. So like for the leftmost free body diagram over here, what would that equation look like? Okay, summing moments around point A. What all creates moments around A? Okay, BY does. What else? T rope in the X direction only. That's good. good call, right? And what else? And F clamp. Okay, let me start with T rope. Okay, so what direction does the X component of T rope cause a rotation around A? Okay. Counterclockwise, right? So it's, if I'm taking counterclockwise as positive, then that means I'm going to have a positive T rope times what? Okay. Let me do something else real quick before I get into that. Okay. If that's 20 and 30, it's actually also valid for me to do 2 and 3. Because all I'm caring about there is the ratio, right? I can do that on all these, right? I'm going to do 2 and 3. That'll make this a little bit more compact when I get ready to write some of my equations. All right, so if I just want the X component, how do I multiply, or what do I multiply by T rope to get just the X component? Okay, three over the square root of three squared plus two squared. 
okay? But that's not enough to have a moment. What else do I need to do to have a moment? Okay? Yeah, I need to multiply that component of force by the length that that you know, of the line of action of that force relative to the point I'm summing moments around. That would be 25 centimeters. Okay? So that's one component so far that I've dealt with. Okay, what's another one? Okay, F clamp, someone says. So I've got a clockwise uh, effect happening from F clamp. So I'm going to take that as a negative. And what's the length that that should be multiplied by? 25 centimeters again, right? Okay, and then what? Okay, right, by but not bx. Why, why by and not bx? That's right, bx has a line of action that extends through point A, right? So what I do there is I take by, it tends to rotate this clockwise or counterclockwise around A. Clockwise, so I'm going to take that as minus by times what? Okay. Anything, excuse me, anything else that would create a uh, rotational tendency around point A on this body? Okay, I don't think so either. I think that's it. Okay, how many unknowns in that equation? Three. So let's move on to the next diagram. Okay, here, let's sum moments around point D. Kind of like point A, we don't care what those reactions are at point D. And there are two things that we don't know, so we can sum moments right there and eliminate those two things from the equation when we sum those moments, right? So, all right, so what do we, uh, what do we have in this equation? Okay, we certainly do have Fe, at least one component of it. Right, because if you think about Fe, if we split it into components, does the vertical component create a moment around D? No, because it's right below it, right? So, but the horizontal component does. And what direction does it tend to act rotationally? Counterclockwise, so I'm gonna take positive Fe times, I'm gonna plug this in as two over three, or excuse me, two over square root of two squared plus three squared like this, okay? Do the same thing that I did on the last uh, couple things where I changed that into a rise of three and a run of two, okay? Uh, is that a moment yet? Okay, we need to multiply by a distance. What distance should we use? 25 centimeters, okay? Now what? Okay, I've got two T ropes, right? Let's do the harder one first, okay? What's the harder one? The one at a slope, right? It's a little bit trickier because both the vertical and the horizontal components both create moments around point D, okay? So let's get, um, I guess I'll just do the, the vertical component of this sloped T rope, okay? To get the vertical component, I'm going to take the vertical part right there, the 2, and divide by the square root, 2 squared plus 3 squared. Okay, then what? Okay. So, so we're going to take this and multiply it by the distance uh, that it is, okay, away from what? D. And that distance from the vertical component of this sloped T rope away from D is 30 centimeters. Okay. Now what about the horizontal component of T rope, the, the sloped T rope? It also will tend to go clockwise, right? So I'm going to do minus again. To get just the horizontal component, what do I multiply by?
Okay. And what do I need to multiply by to make that a moment? A distance. Okay. So we'll say that's going to be at a distance of 20 centimeters plus 25 centimeters away from point D. Because I'm looking at the horizontal component now of this sloped T rope. Okay. So that'll be 45 centimeters. All right. Anything else that creates moments around point D? Okay, we intentionally skipped one, right? It was the vertical one that we, we kind of skipped that and did the, the sloped one first. We come back and get this vertical T rope. And it also tends to go clockwise, right? So I'm going to say minus again. This one doesn't need to be split into components. It's already entirely vertical, right? So I just need to multiply it by that horizontal length of 30 centimeters. Okay. All right. Anything else? Any other terms in this one? OK, that's it. So far, what we have uh, put together are uh, two moment equations, right? One for the left free body diagram about point A and one for the uh, middle of these three that I've got on my page here um, about point D. Where do you think I might be going next? OK, maybe we want to do something similar for the rightmost free body diagram over here and take moments around point B. OK, again, point B is, uh, you know, I don't really necessarily care what BX and BY are to find what I'm supposed to find for this problem, right? So I can just, uh, if I take some of moments around that point, it will eliminate those variables from this equation, but that's okay with me, okay? So I'm going to take some of moments around point B for that free body diagram over there. Um, and so let's think of some forces that would create moments around uh, point B. Okay, certainly the 100 Newton force creates a moment around point B. What else? F clamp, T rope, and FE. Okay, let me start, I guess I'll start with, um, maybe I'll start with T rope. Okay, it doesn't necessarily really matter. But let me start with T rope. Okay, it pulls down at a point to the right of where B is. And so it's going to create what direction of rotation around point B? Clockwise. If counterclockwise is assumed to be positive, I'm going to count this as negative. OK. And what's the length between the line of action of T rope and point B? OK, 15 centimeters. All right. So that's one of the things that I need. What's another one? OK, F clamp. So F clamp, what direction does it act rotationally around B? Counterclockwise. So I'm going to count that as positive. OK, since it is entirely in the horizontal direction, then if I know the vertical length between its line of action and point B, that's what I need to multiply by to get the moment, right? So what is that vertical length from F clamp to point B? 25 centimeters. OK. What else? FE, right? Now, FE is sloped, right? So the, kind of the easiest way to do those generally is to break it into components and figure out the effect of each of the components. OK. So which one do you want to do first? OK, the vertical component first. What direction does that tend to rotate around B? Counterclockwise, so I'm going to count that as positive. But I need to just pick off the vertical component. And like I did on the other ones, if, you'd, if you have 30 and 20, it's actually OK to just do 3 and 2 like this, right? Because the ratio is what matters there, not necessarily the absolute values. OK, so that means I'm going to have Fe times 3 over square root 
2 squared plus 3 squared. Okay, now what? Okay, times the horizontal distance from that line of action the, of the vertical part of FE to point B. 45 centimeters. Okay, because you've got 30 plus 15. All right, so that takes care of the vertical component of FE. What else? Now when you should do the horizontal one, the horizontal component of FE has what effect rotationally around B? Clockwise, right? Clockwise we're going to count as minus. To get just the horizontal component, we'll multiply by 2 over the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. And then multiply that horizontal component of force times what length to get a moment? Okay, that one will be 25 centimeters. All right. So we've taken care of, of T rope, F clamp, and FE now. Anything else? Someone mentioned another one at the beginning, right? Yeah, the 100 Newton force that's applied over there. So how do we treat that? Clockwise, acting at what length away from B? 30 centimeters. OK? And that should take care of everything that creates rotational effects around point B for that body. All right, so it's time to take an inventory again, OK? We have three equations written. How many unknowns are we trying to solve for? OK. Look in these equations. We have T rope, F clamp, BY. We have T rope again over here. We now have another one, FE. So that now we're at four. OK. Over here, we just have T rope, F clamp, and FE, which are all ones that we already counted. So how many do we have? Four. How many equations do we have? Three. OK. Are we ready to solve yet? Probably not yet. OK. What's another thing we could do, though? Do we, have we exhausted all, our, all of our equations that we maybe could use to solve for everything that we need? OK. We have, what I would see is that we, it seems like we have a lot of T ropes, F clamps, and FEs, but we only have one place where BY shows up. Sure would be nice to get rid of it. Do you agree with that? What's a way we could get rid of it? Okay. Yeah, we could certainly sum forces in the Y direction for some, you know, one of these bodies somewhere. Okay. If I do it for the left free body diagram and some forces in the vertical direction, what happens? <laughs> we bring in RAY. That's another unknown. I don't want to do that. So where's another place where BY shows up? This diagram over here, right? The, the right one? BY is there. And BY is going to appear in an equation with what other variables if I do a, a sum of forces in the vertical direction here? It'll be 100 newtons, T rope, and FE. Those are all variables that already appear in the three that we've got. So by doing a sum of forces in the Y, I add one more equation with all the variables that we're already using. Right? It won't have any variables in it that aren't things that we aren't already using. Right? So that means we'll end up with a system of four by four. Okay? So let's go for it. What does that look like? OK. Well, we certainly will have BY. What else? OK, minus 100 Newtons, minus T rope. OK, plus FE, we want to pick off just the vertical component, so we'll multiply by 3 over the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. Okay. 
Any other vertical components? No. That's it. So let me show you this. That's the equation. Could I rewrite it as this? By is equal to 100 newtons plus T rope minus Fe times 3 over the square root 2 squared plus 3 squared. That'd be valid. Why do you think I might want to do that? Okay. Yeah, someone says plug it in. I can plug it in. This, this equation or this uh, variable right here is this variable right here. So I can do a substitution. Right? So what that will look like is this. I'll have T rope times 3 over the square root of 3 squared plus 2 squared times 25 centimeters. That's the first term. Minus F clamp times 25 centimeters. Okay. Now here we got minus BY is 100 newtons plus T rope minus FE times 3 over the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared times what? Because remember, we're rewriting this equation 15 centimeters. Okay? Equals what? All right. Now that we've done that, what do we have? We have three equations in three unknowns. Okay. Now, let me say something real quick. Some of you have a Casio FX991EX. If you have one of those, then you didn't even have to do that step that I just did with that substitution. Why? It does four by fours. You can put in that four by four system and it'll solve it. The one I'm using is this one right here. It's the 115 ES plus. It'll do a three by three. So I had to do a little bit of work to get it to a three by three. And now I'm, I'm in good shape, or at least I should be. What do you think would be a good way though, for me to get completely ready to put this equation into the calculator? How about, yeah. So I'm going to probably factor out the coefficients of each of the variables that I'm trying to solve for, right? Because that's what it wants in input into the calculator, are the coefficients of each of those variables, OK? So let me start there on the left. How would I factor out everything that mattered to me you know, as far as those variables are concerned on the left uh, equation? OK? Does T rope appear in multiple places? Okay, I would say it does. So what I would say is that I would take T rope, and one piece of T rope is going to be this 3 over the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. But then I'm going to take that and multiply it by 25 centimeters. Okay, but the other T rope I have is a minus T rope times 15 centimeters, right? So I'm going to say minus 15 centimeters, right? That takes care of the T rope, factoring that out and sort of collecting it together is all of the coefficient stuff for T rope, OK? Now the next one is F clamp. Does F clamp appear in this thing that we just added in here? No, so we can leave it alone. We can just say minus F clamp times 25 centimeters. All right. What about Fe? Okay, it doesn't appear anywhere else but here, but we still probably ought to isolate it, right? And say we still have this Fe, right? Times three over the square root two squared plus three squared. 
Okay, this times 15 centimeters. Okay, what else? You have the 100 newtons still, right? Now, I'll tell you that the calculator I'm about to use wants that constant term that's not multiplied by any variables. It wants it on the right side of the equation, okay? So I'm going to actually manipulate this and put that 100 newtons times 15 centimeters over on the right side of this equation, okay? So it's negative on this side. It means it's going to be positive on this side. Okay, and so there's one of our equations where we've actually collected together the coefficients of each of the variables that we're interested in. Okay, what next do you think? Okay, yeah, here we probably want to do about the same thing. Let's combine all these T ropes. Since they're all negative, let me do minus T rope times what? Okay, this coefficient here is going to be 2 times 30 centimeters over the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared, okay, plus 3 times 45 centimeters over the square root 2 squared plus 3 squared, okay, plus 30 centimeters. Okay, so everything there between those parentheses is the coefficient that you would have for T rope. All right, what else? I'm going to kind of trick you a little bit here. What's my coefficient of F clamp? Zero. So I'm actually going to explicitly write that here. Plus, zero times F clamp. Okay. What else? Okay, we do have FE. It's positive, right? So plus FE times what? Okay. It'll be times 2 times 25 centimeters over the square root 2 squared plus 3 squared. Anything else? No. Okay, so all of that stuff is my second equation. Okay, what now? One more time. Okay, for this equation over here, what do we need to collect here? All right, well, it looks to me like T rope doesn't need anything. T rope is already multiplied by just 15 centimeters. Okay, what else? F clamp is just multiplied by 25 centimeters. Now, what about FE? If I factor Fe out of these two e equations right here, or these two uh, terms in this equation, what I'll have is 3 times 45 centimeters over the square root 2 squared plus 3 squared minus 2 times 25 centimeters over the square root 2 squared plus 3 squared. Okay, and again, that constant term that's not multiplied by any variable, where do I want that? That's this piece up here. I want to push it to the other side of the equation, which means instead of negative, it's now going to be positive. 100 newtons times 30 centimeters. Okay, now to just really drive this home, let me show you this. Here's what I've done. Okay, there, 
there, including the little minus sign, and here, including the little minus sign, those are the coefficients that I have of T rope, right? Here, including the minus sign, here, and here are the, excuse me, I should really do this not with the variable in there, right? Here, those are the coefficients of F clamp. Okay, and then finally, uh, for this last one, there's the coefficient of Fe. Here's the coefficient of Fe here. Here's the coefficient of Fe here. And then lastly, okay, this is the term that goes on the other side of the expression. That's the term that goes on the other side of the expression. And that's the term that goes on the other side of the expression. Having those marked like this is going to make it really easy to put it into the calculator. Okay, so let's do that. Actually, first, before I do this, let me show you another little trick to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, you do have these different ways to store variables, right? One of the things I'm constantly going to have to do in here is calculate a square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. Let me put that in right now, right? Square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared. Okay, and I'm going to store this into variable A. That way I don't have to type that every time. Okay, so having done that, let's get into uh, mode five on this calculator, it gets you into equation mode. In that mode, it shows you that option two there is a three by three, okay? A n, b n, and c n are the coefficients of your, uh, of your equation. D n is your constant terms, okay? So we're gonna pick two. What should I put for this entry? Okay. We probably should put 3 times 25 divided by A minus 15. Okay. What next? Okay. That was this entry right here. Next, we've got minus 25 centimeters for F clamp. Okay, next we have the coefficient of Fe, right? That'll be 3 times 15, right, divided by A. And then lastly, 100 times 15. Okay, that's this piece right here. So we're done with our first equation. Second equation, we're going to put in minus... Okay, bunch of stuff in parentheses here. 2 times 30 over A, right, plus 3 times 30, excuse me, 3 times 45 over A, plus 30. Okay, what's my coefficient of F clamp? For this equation, zero, right? What next? Two times 25 divided by what I had stored in A, which is that square root, right? And then lastly, zero. Now I'm on to my last equation here. Minus 15. Got 25 there, right? Here I'm going to have, okay, I'm going to put these in parentheses. We'll have 3 times 45 divided by A, right, minus 2 times 25 divided by A. And then lastly, on the other side of the equation, I've got 100 newtons times 30 centimeters. What happens when I hit equals? The first thing that it gives you is what? T rope. So I'm going to write these down here. T rope 
is going to be equal to 21.488. What? Newtons. Okay. When I hit equals again, what's that give me? F clamp. This is of a special interest to us, right? 10.03. Say F clamp. 10.03 Newtons. Okay, and then what else? Okay, the last one here is Fe, 130.29, we'll say. Newtons. And that is Fe. All right, now let's remind ourselves what it, is we were, what it is we were trying to do, right? We needed the mechanical advantage, right? Output force over input force. We know our input force we used to get this was 100 newtons. So that goes in the denominator. What was our output force? Okay. Our output force is this 10.03 newtons. And to this I would say, that doesn't look very advantageous. That's okay, it's still considered a mechanical advantage, right? It's just less than one, right? It's a fractional mechanical advantage. All right, so we actually finished just now with what this problem requested us to do. Who wants to do a little bit more? No one in here is curious what the member forces are in the truss. Nobody even cares. Okay. That's okay with me. We can, we can uh, call it good right here. Oh, we got one person who says we should go ahead and find the forces in the members of the truss. And because we have one vote, the needs of the few outweigh the needs of the many. Um, so let's actually do that. Let's actually look at that little truss part, right? We have this little truss part right here. We treated it like it was one big chunk just a second ago. What if we want to know what those forces are inside of that truss? Well, let's draw it, right? So the, the shape of that truss is gonna look something like this. Okay, and we know a few things now, right? We know that there's this force over here of Fe, which is 130.29 Newtons, right? It's still at a slope, just like we had before right, of uh, 3 over 2. Okay, what else acts on the truss? Would you say T-rope acts right here? We can go back up and look. Okay, T-rope acts right here. So that is a force of 21.488 newtons. Okay, what else? Okay, F clamp acts to the right, right there. So that now is a known force that acts right here. F clamp is 10.03 Newtons. Okay, what else? All right, what did you say? The 100 pounds up here. Excuse me, not pounds, newtons. I think that's number three that I've messed that up. All right. 
Okay. We also have these up here, right? I think these were the directions that I had them. By and Bx. Here's a question I've got. Do I need to know those? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Okay. This is B, C, what was this one down here? E. And this was G. Okay. This is our, our uh, truss. What else do we need to know about it, actually? Some distances. The height of the truss was 25 centimeters. Thirty here, it was fifteen here, right? Well, fifteen to here. And it was thirty down here. All right. What's a good thing to do first if what we're trying to find is all of these member forces? We could cut it. Okay. What does that do if we cut it? Okay. I think maybe, I, I don't know if this is what you mean, but you're saying maybe could we cut it down through like this? Okay, let's try it. Let's see what happens. If we cut it down through like that, what do you want to do a free body diagram of? Okay, either the right or the left. I would actually say since we have some unknown things over there on the left, BX and BY, let's do a free body diagram of the right. Okay, so here's what that would look like. Okay, that's CE. Now let's look at the forces acting on CE. FE of 130.29 newtons. Rise of three, run of two. Okay, what else? Hundred newtons acting up there. What else? Okay, GC. So let me call that TGC. Or I, I don't know. Maybe I'm uh, overly picky. A lot of times I like to try to do alphabetical order. Okay, what else? Okay, TBC. and EG. Okay, yeah, so someone says we need the slope of CG. Okay, what would that slope be? A rise of 25 for a run of 15. Okay. So that is a free body diagram of member CE, which is the, everything to the right of the cut that we made. What can we do with it? You could. Yeah, someone says, can we simplify this ratio first? What would it do? Okay. So this would be 3, and this would be 5, right? Okay, good. What else do I need to know, though? Okay, we could do a sum of forces in the y direction to find TCG, and I, I very likely, you know, may do that. Um, let me get the, the dimensions on here first. Let me put this at 15 centimeters and the height at what? Was it 25 centimeters? Okay. So I think I had a suggestion just now to sum forces in the y direction to find TCG. Okay. Sounds good to me. Let's do that one first. Minus TCG, okay, times what? OK, 
Okay. Then what? Minus 100 newtons plus 130.29 newtons times what? How many unknowns? Okay. One unknown. TCG. One equation, one unknown. Let's solve for it. Do you want me to do that out longhand or do you want to trust me? You want to trust me? Okay. So this is CG, right? Uh, where did I have CG? Here it is. 9.805. Newtons. All right. Then what? Okay. If we do a sum of moments around C, we could find TEG. Okay. I agree with that. Okay. So to do that, I end up with a clockwise moment around C of TEG okay, times what? 25 centimeters. Then I need to t account for both of the components of the 130.29 newtons. Right? So let me do the, I guess I'll do the vertical one first. Okay, 130.29 Newtons times 3 over the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared times what? 15 centimeters. Then I need to take care of the horizontal component of the 130.29. That would tend to have a clockwise effect there. So I would say minus 130.29 Newtons times 2 over the square root, 2 squared plus 3 squared. All right. This multiplied by 25 centimeters. And I think that takes care of everything that would have moment or would create moments around C. Okay? And when you solve for TEG with this one equation, one unknown system, it ends up giving you minus 7.227 newtons. Okay, what does that negative sign mean there? Okay, there's a good answer and there's a better answer. A good answer is that means it's in compression. Okay, that's correct. But why? Because we assume tension, right? The better answer is it's the opposite of what we assumed, right? Because that's always true. Okay, so that's minus two, uh, 7.227, which means a compressive force of 7.227 newtons in member uh, EG. Okay, anything else we can do on this one? We could sum x forces, okay? That's also true. What would that look like? Okay, so we have uh, minus, minus 7.227 newtons, okay? Well, then what? Okay, minus TBC. What else? Minus TCG, but only the horizontal component of it. So I need to multiply by 3 over the square root of 3 squared plus 5 squared. Right? 
What else? Minus 130.29 newtons times 2 over the square root of, of 2 squared plus 3 squared. And remember that TCG is something that we know, right? So I can plug that in. 9.805 newtons. All right, and this can be solved for TBC. And when you do that, it ends up giving you negative 70.09 newtons. All right, what do we lack? Okay, we still don't know uh, the force in BG. We also don't know the force in CE, right? How do we get those? I think someone says, could you cut this way? Was that, was that the suggestion? You can. I like method of joints better for this. Okay. That would work. I'm not going to say you couldn't do that. But as a matter of fact, like what I just did up here is completely different than what I did in my notes. Like this, you know, you guys wanted to do it different. So we did it different, right? So uh, came up with the same results. All right, so um, here's how I would do it. I would look at a joint at E, right? At E, you have TCE, okay? This is, again, joint E. You have TCE. What else? TEG. And then what else? Okay. Fe, where you know that slope of Fe. It has a rise of 3 and a run of 2. And Fe was 130.29 newtons. Based on this free body diagram, how do you figure out TCE? Okay. Yeah, all you got to do here is just sum the Y forces. And what you'll see here is you've got TCE. Oh, actually, I, I missed one thing for TCE, didn't I? What's its slope? Okay. It's going to be the same as it was up here where it has a rise of 25 for a run of 15. That just basically means a, a run of 3 and a rise of 5. Okay. Hopefully you're with me on that. All right, so now what we do is we take um, TCE, but just the vertical component, okay, plus Fe of 130.29 newtons, and just the vertical component of that. All right, and if we plug that in and solve, we get TCE of negative 126.42. All right, we're missing one thing. What is it? Okay. Yeah, we don't know 
this force in BG yet? Okay, what might be a good way to get it? Joint G, right? So let me uh, tell you what, this will be cleaner if I can just do this. Scooch myself some space right there. Joint G. Joint G has a force downward of 21.488 newtons. It has a force to the right of 10.03 newtons. It has a force that we're trying to find here of TBG. It has a force that we already know, TCG. It also has another force that we already know, TEG. For the forces that are sloped, we happen to know what the slopes are of those. Uh, run of three for a rise of five. Run of three for a rise of five. Let me write in the things that we know. What's TEG? Okay, negative 7.227. TCG? Okay, 9.805 newtons. All right, what looks like an easier equation to write for this one? Because you have an x equation and a, right, and a y equation you can write for this one. Okay, I agree, the y equation looks just a smidge easier. Why is that? Okay. You eliminate two of these terms that would be there as opposed to if you do um, you know, the horizontal direction, you only eliminate one term. Okay, so I agree. Summing forces in the y direction looks like it's just a little bit easier. So there we're gonna do uh, TBG times five over the square root of five squared plus three squared plus TCG times five over the square root of five squared plus three squared, then what? Minus 21.488 newtons. And we solve this for TBG. TBG ends up being 15.25 newtons. All right. I'm glad we did all that, Bryce. I'm glad you suggested it, because that gave us a little review of trusses as well, both method of joints as well as method of sections. And so really, we've covered everything that's going to be on this test that's coming up, right? We covered frames and machines, including the idea of mechanical advantage, and including the idea that you can have a truss embedded in there, and the truss can act like its own little member. We also included the idea that if you're not given a force um, and you're trying to find mechanical advantage, you can just assume one and uh, solve through and, and figure out what the output is um, and, and then get uh, output over input and that gives you your mechanical advantage, okay? Um, so, and then of course we, we covered our trust topics as well, method of joints, method of sections.